For most young people, the great American dream starts out with a commitment to share life's joys and burdens with another. They'll spend their early years working hard in their chosen careers, attempting to secure a comfortable future for themselves and for their growing family. joker in the deck. Take a good look at that. It's a human bronchial passage, and that little lump is a tumor. Unfortunately, a malignant tumor. In other words, cancer. One out of four Americans will contract some form of cancer during his or her lifetime. During this decade of the 70s, Three and one half million of us in this country alone will die because those maverick cells are growing unchecked somewhere in our body, lungs, liver, even affecting the blood itself. We tend to regard cancer as an unpredictable disease, our chance of getting it a matter of luck, like the flip of the coin or the roll of the dice. But science has been discovering some things about cancer that are predictable. We're finding out that in 60 to 90 percent of the cases, cancer is caused by something we're exposed to, something from outside our bodies. It might be in what we eat, drink, breathe, or smoke. It might be in our urban atmosphere. And increasingly, in recent years, we're discovering that the seeds of some cancers are being sown in the workplace. Unlike the occupational hazard that's obvious, the giant rip saw, the molten metal, the rigor's lofty perch, the origins of cancer in the workplace are subtle. They might be microscopic particles or chemical fumes, low levels of radiation, a large amount at one time is bad, but even taken in small doses day after day, they build up like a long-term bank account. The only difference is that this bank account pays off in a slow, lingering death, short-circuiting all the grand plans we made, wiping out those long-awaited golden years. <laughs> And he was big, you know? And to see a grown man cry, it was something, you know, you knew something was wrong. He says, well, he says, Marie, he says, I'm next to die. This disease came from the chemicals that he handled rawly at the place that he worked because there are, upon many physicals that he was giving, there was entirely nothing else wrong with his body outside of that. After he had already retired, I think, he had found uh, an article about cancer and about construction science, and he asked me one day, he said, you think maybe that this is what I've already got, but this was just before the doctors had told him that this is what he's wanted. How do we know that a man's occupation might be dangerous to his long-range health? How can anyone point to an industrial substance and state positively that it causes cancer? Sometimes scientists are a little embarrassed when we're asked, what took us so long to begin to discover that things are causing cancer in the workplace? Well. Nature played a dirty trick on us in one sense. Most things that cause cancer take a long time uh, to do it. Kids begin smoking, for example, at uh, 
15, 19, 11, and they don't die at 21 of lung cancer or even at 30. They die at 50. They die at 60. This long period of clinical latency, the same thing is true of cancers in the workplace for the most part. And therefore, it's been hard to, to find out that something that someone was exposed to 20 or 30 years ago is responsible for the cancer that he now has. Taken one case at a time, an individual death, even a cancer death, tells us very little. But when many men with similar work exposures are examined, an unusual pattern will draw attention to itself. For example, we undertook a large study of roofing workers, the materials they handled, their day-to-day -day working conditions. Part of the study was an analysis of the death records of the union members. After reviewing 6,000 cases, researchers at the American Cancer Society and Mount Sinai Medical School discovered that age for age there was indeed a greater number of deaths among roofers than among the general population. And of those deaths, there was a much greater number of cancers than should normally have been expected. It's only when we, in a sense, count the headstones that it suddenly occurs to us that maybe some things in the coke ovens or some things in the dye vats are leading people to an early grave. We may not know exactly what is causing cancer, but we are finding out that there are some things in certain occupations that are clearly associated with more cancers than we ordinarily would expect. Asbestos is one hazard that we've known about for some time. You're looking at an example of a clean asbestos plant with workers properly protected from the dust. Now, mind you, it wasn't this way in the past, and, and I'm sorry to say it still isn't this way in some asbestos operations, both large and small around the country. I started out in the saw room uh, as a knob catcher, and I worked in the saw room for approximately a month. And I was moved back in the back to a feeder. And I worked as a feeder, uh, I would say approximately four months. And it was very dusty back there. And at the time, we, it wasn't mandatory for us to wear dust masters or nothing like that. In other words, you couldn't help but inhale them the asbestos particles because you can see it flying all around in the air. Asbestos dust actually contains many microscopic mineral particles. They embed themselves in the lungs, scarring the delicate tissue that's there. And really given good. sufficient really exposure, this brings on a number of crippling that's lung diseases. Okay, now we're going to do one more. Please. Coupled with smoking, Exposure to asbestos dramatically increases a worker's chance of developing lung cancer. The even non-smokers exposed to asbestos fibers run the risk of developing other forms of cancers. Uranium miners are also at increased risk of developing a cancer. The radioactive particles combine with the dust in the mine atmosphere, and when they're inhaled, the entire respiratory tract receives a small bombardment, as it were, of radiation. Although this in itself induces an increase in cancer, when coupled with cigarette smoke, the worker again is far more susceptible to cancer than he would be if exposed to either the radiation or the cigarettes alone. One of our problems is that things don't stand still, and whatever happened in the past may or may not uh, exist today. For example, take painters. There are, oh, perhaps 350,000 painters in our country. Well, 30 years ago, there was linseed oil in the uh, paint and uh, turpentine and so forth. It didn't seem to cause much trouble. Well, there's a whole new ball game now in the painting trades. Uh, for example, uh, paints are complex chemicals. 
as you know, there are epoxy paints and there are vinyl paints and uh, there are all kinds of very specialized uh, paints. And we don't, for the most part, know uh, the effects that these might have. We do know, however, that taken as a whole, painters run a greater risk of developing cancer and a much greater risk of developing cancer in the lungs and the respiratory tract. That belching chimney, it's about as tall as the Washington Monument, is economically reassuring, for it stands as the symbol of 5,000 jobs made possible by the Montana copper smellers. And there are thousands of other copper workers and smelters like these in other counties, other states. Regardless of where they work, they have something in common. Each is taking home more than simply a weekly paycheck. Something in the smelting process is inducing lung cancer. Well, when I was a child, <coughs> we lived close to a smelter. And uh, the smoke used to come over there once in a while. And uh, it was pretty strong. But that sulfur, sulfur, I guess, sulfur smoke. I had a brother, he died of cancer too. And uh, a sister had cancer. Again, we have no proof of what in detail is causing the increase in the death rate. But many health officials believe that it is the arsenic that is found in the ores involved in the copper smelting. Most of the things to which we're now exposed are almost post-World War II. The whole plastics industry, the whole chemical industry, had its marked growth in the last 30 years. Uh, therefore, most of the cancers that would be associated with our, our new chemical environment are only now upon us to begin with, and uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, they're going to be with us in the next 30 years, uh, pretty much no matter what we do now. In New Jersey, some people have cynically referred to this as Cancer Alley the greatest concentration of chemical plants in the Western Hemisphere. It also has the greatest concentration of cancer deaths in the nation. And obviously, the question of an association has naturally been raised. Now the idea that chemicals can cause cancer is not new, and therefore a proper question is, uh, where did we go wrong in not anticipating this? Well, first of all, uh, the chemicals that have been known up until the turn of the century to produce cancer were chemicals that were part of our natural environment. The products of burning organic products, wood, paper. Uh, they were the products of uh, microbes in the environment that, that contaminated and infested our food. And we really didn't uh, assume or we weren't prepared for the fact that synthetic chemicals could produce cancer. This is polyvinyl chloride a synthetic resinous material converted from vinyl chloride gas. And it's the basis for thousands of plastic products, from food wrappers to phonograph records. In its final marketable form, it's as safe as any ordinary household item. But during the manufacturing process, when the gas is being synthesized and the resin is being formed, exposure can present a serious risk causing a relatively rare form of cancer called angiosarcoma. It attacks the liver, and unfortunately, it's invariably fatal, or at least to the present. Information that vinyl chloride could cause cancer in animals was known as early as 1970, but it was not until the actual deaths of workers were reported that industry began to heed the signals. There used to be open house. We used to get on the train. Oh, on open house, they had balloons and stuff like that. And as children, you were allowed to take the train ride with your parents, and they'd take you all through the plant. And, of course, you only seen the good, clean, you know, the clean spots. But, uh, like, you would hear your father say, you know, this is where I work. And you would look over that way, and you could see, like, um, yellow stuff coming out of the kettles. And, uh, and he would say, you know, he would say, well, gee, Dad, don't you wear... Uh, protective gloves or something like that, and he would say, 
no, they don't, you know, you don't have to. It's not dangerous. And um, in the open house, though, that, that stopped after, like, a, three or four of the men had died. Even though management has since installed equipment and procedures that would protect future workers, significant damage had already been done. Tens of thousands of workers have been exposed over the past three decades, and so far, little can be done for them except careful monitoring and medical surveillance. You have to recultivate your life. Living throughout a job, you worked all your life, you're young. I'm just only 50. Came 50 years old, 22nd day of January of this year. And I'm still plenty young to work if I had good health. Frequently the risk is determined by how willingly and effectively a worker cooperates with work practices and work procedures directed to reducing the risk. This can be manifest in many ways. In the area of health and cancer, it finds expression in the use of masks, respirators. It can be done in a way of personal hygiene, after work, appropriately treating the body and your work clothes, even to the point of not going home in work clothes. In terms of lifestyle, we know that for dusts and fumes that attack the lungs, the combination of the work exposure and the cigarette exposure is a deadly combination. Starting 10 or 15 years ago, we had a very uncomfortable piece of bad news. We found that the things which cause cancer in the workplace don't necessarily stay in the workplace. The, the factory gate is certainly no barrier to them. Very often workers will bring home some of the dusts and chemicals with which they work, and we've begun to find that their wives and children can get the same kind of cancers that they might get simply as a result of working. There are tens of thousands of synthesized chemicals in commercial use, and of these, nearly 1,500 are suspect of causing cancer to both workers who are exposed to them in the manufacturing process and to the general public. Experimental toxicology itself has progressed from an era in which we did nothing more than literally count the number of dead animals in a cage and believe that we had produced a, a new finding, that we had made a measurement of safety, to today when we have elaborate, sophisticated techniques for studying the effects of chemicals on various organs and subsystems of a number of experimental animals, and in some cases, even of man. A monumental problem facing the toxicologist is the time it takes to complete a series of animal tests, which might take as long as two years. Scientists throughout both government and industry are pressing forward to evolve short-term tests that will enable him to rapidly predict which materials appear to be low risk and which seem likely candidates for causing cancer it is necessary to control exposures to toxic chemicals so that the hazard is minimized, so that the hazard falls well within socially acceptable limits. Here's where society must participate. The single most vital step in minimizing risks on the job without banning the substance is to eliminate or at least minimize exposures to the worker. This means closing the system, sealing the process within closed vats, piping, tanks, or what have you, keeping the dust fumes and the vapors out of the workers' atmosphere. This is the Panasoak Company of New York, their New Jersey plant in the heart of the chemical belt. They are processing vinyl chloride, proven to be a cancer-producing killer, and they're reducing the risks by using a carefully controlled system. Gas detecting sensors spotted at key worker stations throughout the plant are tied to a central control bank. If the gas levels exceed the safety threshold, warning lights alert the workers in the hot area. This is another closed system, this time at a 
Burlington Textile Mill. It used to be a common practice to immerse fabrics in open vats. Many of the dyes and the chemicals used in textile processing and finishing are highly toxic. Some may be carcinogenic. With the system closed like this, the chemicals and their vapors, though still toxic, are sealed tightly, cutting off the employees from potential hazard. Because when you're working out in the plant, you're exposed to several different compounds. Of equal importance is the responsibility of management and labor unions to educate workers and their immediate supervisors on the risk present in the workplace. This is a regular safety session for supervisors run by Dow Chemical in their Texas plant. Minimizing exposure to the employees and to the community is a responsibility that must also be shared by the workers as well. To assume this responsibility, they must first be informed about the risks. Well, I think the men should be told before they even start the job what the chances are and let them make the choice. The government should step in and do something about this. I mean, uh, why let them young people die? The prevention of occupational disease and occupational cancer in the workplace cannot be looked upon as an adversary uh, battle, adversary between uh, labor and management or indeed between the labor management and the consuming public. That method has failed and that's why uh, the Occupation Health and Safety Act was passed in 1970 to bring a new ingredient into workplace. The hearings with respect to the proposal. Without the public responsibility, without this public sector uh, obligation, uh, to be concerned about the worker in the workplace, that workplace will not be conducive to the worker's health. There are a number of reasons for this. One of the reasons, of course, will be the lack of knowledge on the part of the worker. And without the, the uh, research capacity of the federal government, uh, the different agencies like the National Cancer Institute for one, and certainly NIOSH and OSHA and EPA, without these agencies and the resources at their hand, we would not have the public disclosure of what actually is taking place in the workplace. These last few decades have seen the unparalleled proliferation of chemical compounds in industry and in the marketplace. For the most part, these exotic substances benefit man in more productive agriculture, better consumer products, more effective medicine. But increasingly, we're finding these benefits can carry high price tags in terms of the health and even the lives of the men and women who are exposed to them during the manufacturing process. It has only been recently that most of us have become aware of these risks. It's unfortunate that we as a society have to learn the hard way. But much of what we know about cancer we learn from people who have it, who have had it, and who have died from it. In the past, it is all too clear that management, for the most part, determines the level of the risk in the workplace, either through ignorance of the real hazards involved or through a failure to consider work practice alternatives. We've known the benefits on the one side, and they are educating us to the risks on the other. Now it's going to be up to all of us to face up to the responsibility of making the decisions as to what will go on in the workplace. Fires and who still tell the earth?